My name is Michalis Bletsas, I'm uh, the VP of Advanced Technology and Connectivity here at One Laptop Per Child and right now I think I'm the oldest employee of OLPC wow. uh, after Nicholas who is not technically an employee so I guess I'm the old guard. <laughs> Very cool. And you met Nicholas at the uh, MIT Media Lab? Yes, I used to work for him at the MIT Media Lab. And you've done all sorts of experiments you were telling me with wireless. Tell me a little bit about how you got well, the expertise I, to build one of these. Uh, I didn't build that by myself. I no. mean, this is, you know, this is a team effort with many people uh, involved. But uh, my main expertise is uh, wireless data communications. And I guess it grew out of uh, a passion that I had as a kid. I built my first radio when I was seven years old. It was a radio receiver, of course, very simple thingy. And uh, I, I studied electrical engineering and computer engineering in Greece and here. And I was always going back to the concept of wireless communications. And where I really found my colleague was when pre-Wi-Fi networks started emerging. So the Media Lab was probably one of the first places in the world that had full coverage of wireless network. I did that back in 96. And I paid a lot of attention, or I spent a lot of time doing things with the early wireless hardware, then Wi-Fi. Uh, we ended up uh, doing uh, large area Wi-Fi networks back in 2000 in places like uh, Patmos, Greece, and Cambodia, where Nicholas had built a couple of schools. And hence, I gravitated towards the OLPC project. And I'm responsible, where I'm responsible for the communication aspects of the laptop, mostly. And that always caught my eye about the OLPC when my friends have shown it to me. When you get two together, it, it sort of understands there's another one close by. I mean, th these are designed to go into a village where there might not be electricity and there might not be a broadband <laughs> connection, right? Laptops are communication devices. And uh, Wi-Fi, uh, or Wi-Fi style hardware is can be used in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Uh, unfortunately, in our environments, we tend to always look for some kind of infrastructure. Infrastructure always makes things uh, better, uh, but you know these laptops are going to go in places where there is nothing around and telling to kids that, look, you have this very capable communications device, but you can't really use it because, you know, your school has to put infrastructure or you have to have an access point at home or things like that. It doesn't seem to me like the right thing to do for a device like that. So very early on, we said that we are going to make sure that these laptops can communicate and can collaborate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. It might be something as simple as taking a picture out of the camera and sending it out to the laptop next to you, to the kid next to you, or working together on a document, or having a chat capability. You are, for example, in a low-income uh, housing project, and the kids have these laptops, which is a real-world scenario that we tested with in Brazil, in Porto Alegre in Brazil. We can't really expect the kids to have, you know, municipal Wi-Fi to be able to do something as simple as chat. So hence, uh, the development, the development of this and the design of this uh, was we tried to incorporate that notion of peer-to-peer -peer yeah. networking from the beginning. That's why you get these funny antennas, which they are cute also. They, they add, I think, to the 
aesthetic of it. The aesthetic of it. But uh, the bottom line is that with these antennas, you are able to do peer-to-peer -peer links between laptops that are twice as long as you would if you had just buried the antennas inside the lid of the laptop like normal laptops have. What, what kind of distance, if I was in a, a poor village, what kind of distance between laptops can I get? Is well, it, it depends on how uh, uh, quiet the radio environment is. Uh, but we have been routinely seeing distances of two to three to four hundred meters in radio quiet environments. And actually, we have a collaborator somewhere in the outback of Australia who was able to uh, uh, stream audio between two laptops continuously on a distance of, I believe it was 1,200 meters between the laptops. Now, normal laptops can probably do that uh, with a little bit more difficulty. The antennas just make sure that that range is maximized as much as possible. Your laptop doesn't really care about that distance because all you have to do is hit an access point, which is a few meters away in most cases. Yeah. Here, we wanted to maximize other types of scenarios. The added benefit that we get is that we get better reception also in normal access point scenarios. So I've been in many hotels carrying Ixo laptops, and I'm able to hit like access points across the street that I'm not able to do with my very expensive uh, normal laptop, commercial laptop. Tell me about some of the projects that you've seen kids use uh, the OLPC for using wireless. What, you, what kinds of things are they able to do? What, are they able to build games? Or the most popular application is obviously chat. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, this is not something that is uh, uh, by any means limited to LPC. It is just that with these laptops, and that's the application that I happen to have up. The peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc chat is the default mode. Yeah. So you don't need a server, you don't need a login. It reminds more of the uh, reminds you more of the older uh, IRC type of uh, chat rooms, or even the older right chat that we used to have on the Linux uh, environment. So yeah. there is no login. You basically type here. So does and each computer have its own identity then? Yes, basically, and the identity is listed ah, okay. IRC style yeah. there. And you see it color-coded here. Uh, and obviously, we do have a server mode for this, because if you have you know, hundreds of kids in a school, you're not going to be able to do that in an uh, ad hoc, complete yeah. ad hoc fashion. but. What we found is that, for example, in Peru, in the first villages that we deployed that, the kids would take the laptops at home, and at night, they would use the chat application between each other. Yeah. Now, given that we also have a mesh network built in on those, uh, the range of the cloud or the diameter of the cloud that you can create is much, much larger uh, compared to what you could make using a normal laptop, because yeah. this thing's multi-hop. So if I have, uh, let's say, a 10-mile corridor, and I have a kid here, kid here, kid here, kid here, kid here, this kid can talk to this kid? Yes. Okay. Eventually. Through all I mean, the other? Yeah, I mean, you, you might have, if you, in, in this environment, if you have a 10-mile corridor and you have 10 kids, you might tell the kids that they have to go up on their roofs and stick their antennas as high <laughs> as possible in order to make the collection. But the bottom line is that, yes, if they try, they will be able to do that. And that's one of the main themes around the laptop in general. It's not give them everything ready. This is not a PSP where you get very elaborate games which yeah. are ready and then you enjoy just the game. The idea is to also try and make some things for yourself. Uh, another very popular application is the camera application, which by the way has sharing built in. So you take a picture and you can immediately share it with all the laptops in the vicinity. That's a very popular application. We have something else. Uh, if you want to be a little bit more elaborate, there is a whole learning environment uh, uh, called eToys, which is essentially a 
simulation, uh, visual programming, you can do all sorts of things. You can write games, you can write small, yes, or much more complex uh, uh, simulations. You can do physics experiments simulated there, and it's the work of uh, Alan Kay. And there are special communications capabilities, so you can actually connect all of the laptops together in a you can make them run the same simulation in three laptops. So you can have, for example, a car start from one laptop, pass to the next, and then yeah. continue to the third. And uh, things a like friend that. of mine showed me that game. It's really a lot of fun, and it teaches you a lot of interesting skills that a, that a normal PC. I haven't seen anybody do that on a normal PC. You, know? you can. The funny thing is that you can do most of the stuff in a normal PC these days, but they are hidden. Yeah. So deeply into the complexity of the normal PC, and they are also uh, uh, sometimes discouraged by security implications, by things like that. I mean, you have to remember, uh, after 30 years of personal computing, we are back in the era of the floppy. I yeah. mean, the floppy rules, when you have to make a file transfer, the medium of choice for everybody is the USB flash key, which you know, it's the same principle like the floppy, exactly. I mean, you put it here, you put, we have communications networks in our laptops, we have adapters. I mean, nobody knows, for example, if you take two people and they have to transfer a video, a very big file, from one laptop to another. Uh, none of them knows how to take an Ethernet cable and connect the two laptops together and zip it. Yeah. If you have some very sophisticated people, they might know how to make an ad hoc network and certain laptops come with helpers to help you do certain things over the ad hoc network, but that's like a very small minority. So despite the fact that the hardware and the low level software can do it, uh, the user interface doesn't do it at all. You have an application like Skype, for example, which is the best example of a peer to peer application and it can't work unless it has access yeah. how many, uh, how, what percentage uh, you've you've sold uh, hundreds of thousands of these already mm -hmm. what percentage do you know are actually connected to the internet so that I could talk with a, a kid or I would say at this point in time uh, um, do you keep more track than half we more can't half. really keep track but we have a very good uh, we can make very good uh, educated guesses Okay. if you want. Uh, we know, for example, that pretty much all of the laptops in Uruguay have uh, internet access, broadband internet access, at least while the kids are in school. Yeah. In certain occasions, uh, they have internet access even if they are out of school, yeah. as long as they are close to the school. Uh, we know for a fact that in Peru that is the percentage is smaller just because the schools have less internet infrastructure if they have any. So I would say that at this point in time it's about 50-50. In most other places that we have gone uh, we make a case that the laptops have to go into the school with some kind of internet connectivity yeah. for the school. So we try to make uh, to insist on that, and I think that we have su succeeded in most places. Uh, obviously, you know, you are in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, mm, you're not going to find too much internet connectivity there. But it's very interesting, the modes of usage with all the nomads there and what they can do every night. I mean, if you live in a tent, suddenly you have this thing and all the tents can communicate <laughs> during the night or you can have you know peer-to-peer -peer networks via camels or things like that but no uh, broadband internet connectivity <laughs> in these places very interesting <laughs> well thank you so much uh, is, is there anything else because we're uh, almost out of uh, space on our uh, cards is there anything else that uh, you, you want to tell us technically about the device because since you run that yeah uh, well I can tell you many things besides uh, I think that the technical characteristics have been uh, pretty much out there for a long time. Uh, it is still two and a half years 
after its inception, it is still the lowest power laptop you can get out there. And we'd like to improve that by a factor of two. Uh, the, thing, the main thing that we missed with a first generation laptop is that it's still not really a human power device. In order to have a real human power device, you have to be below two watts. And we are at now at about five, which is much, much better than anything else out there. But it's still not human powered. But we are solar powered right How now. big a solar device do you need to power the? I can bring you one, actually. Uh, you need, uh, obviously, you have to have in mind uh, uh, how much money you have yeah. and how much time do you have to, to charge it. Yeah. Uh, this is a 20 watt hour battery. So, you know, if you have, if you are in a pretty sunny place and you can afford uh, to not use it for four hours during peak, during the afternoon, during early afternoon, you can use a $10 uh, solar panel, literally a $10 retail, amorphous silicon, very inexpensive solar panel that is not going to draw the attention of anybody else because it's going to be pretty small for anything else and you're going to charge this fine. If you're going to spend a little bit more money and get, you know, a 12 watt or a 20 watt, which is going to be a 20 watt is going to be about a square foot in relatively high quality, then you can charge it a lot faster. Uh, of course, the bigger the solar panel that you are going to use, the more uh, uh, attractive it becomes for somebody to come and steal it <laughs> for something else. So we like to make this as low power as possible because that's the biggest uh, uh, challenge that we see in uh, the developing world. Power is still not a given. Thank you so much. Very uh, welcome, David. It's been a real pleasure. It's become